Bernie in Northern California. Little more than a stretch of highway with a few shops, motels, a nightclub, and a diner. But just 30 minutes away, hidden among the Hat Creek Mountains, is a laboratory carrying out pioneering research. Top American scientists are hunting for extraterrestrial civilizations. Exciting new discoveries have been causing quite a stir amongst the smartest people on Earth. We're now closer than ever to answering the big question. Are we alone in the universe? If you assume that this is the only planet where anything interesting is happening, where life has developed, where intelligent life has developed, then you're saying that the Earth is very special. And there doesn't seem to be any reason to think that the Earth is that special. One nice thing about radio observatories is they put them in uh, usually spectacular locations that are far away from people. It's like another day at the office, but you gotta say, it's a beautiful office. Volcanoes, lava beds, nature, snakes. Radio waves come in from the cosmos, they bounce off that big reflector there, that six meter reflector, and then they get bounced again, and then they go into a big receiver, and then those signals are sent into uh, to a building over there where they're analyzed. But this is a very sensitive array. I mean, you know, people make calculations. You, you could pick up a cell phone on Jupiter. Not that there are any cell phones on Jupiter, but that gives you some idea of how sensitive radio technology really is. Astronomer Dr. Seth Shostak is one of the 130 top scientists working at the SETI Institute. The acronym stands for Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, and the organization was founded in 1984. These are all radio telescopes, and we're using them to try and detect someone else's transmissions, some technology from a distant planet around a distant star, to understand whether or not there are any other technological civilizations in our galaxy. Why are you doing that? Well, we'd like to know, are we alone? We've been asking that question for millennia. Right? And one way that we might get an answer is by finding the smart folks out there. Dr. Jill Tata is also an astronomer and one of the Institute's founders. A few years ago, Time magazine voted her one of the 100 most influential people on Earth. We've been doing SETI for 50 years. We've hardly begun to search. If you make an analogy, the cosmic ocean that we want to search, compare that to the oceans on the Earth. Well, so far, what we've sampled is one glass of water from the Earth's oceans. So there's a lot more to be done. Well, in the fastest rockets we have, to go to the nearest other star would take you about 100,000 years, one-way trip. The universe is really big. Our local star, the Sun, is middle-aged, orbited by eight planets, and humanity aside is otherwise fairly unexceptional. Proxima Centauri, currently the next closest star, is some 25 million million miles away. Sometimes it's hard to imagine just how vast the universe is. How big is it? Well, we're in a galaxy. It's called the Milky Way. The number of stars in the, in the galaxy, our galaxy, is a few hundred thousand million. That's a lot of stars. But there are at least a few hundred thousand million other galaxies each was a similar number of stars. Now, how many of those stars had planets? We don't know for sure, but at least half of them do, maybe more. So what that means is the number of planets in the part of the universe we can see with our telescopes is about equal to the number of sand grains on all the beaches of the Earth. Now that's a huge number. That's a one followed by 23 zeros. That's such an enormous number that if this is the only sand grain with intelligent life on it, that means we are some sort of miracle. And one thing you learn by being a scientist is not to believe in miracles. The SETI Institute works closely with the US space organization, NASA, and with the University of California in Berkeley. UC Berkeley has single-handedly produced 66 Nobel Prize winners. That's more than most countries. 
many SETI scientists either teach or have studied here. In short, this is a select bunch of some of the world's most celebrated scientists. We're made out of stardust, and so it's stardust studying the stars. We're what's happen what happens to hydrogen and helium after billions of years of evolution, till it finally gets around to, to being sentient and figuring out where it came from. It is uh, a story about who we are and where we came from that's based on data. It's based on observations. Ever faster computers have enabled us to point radio telescopes more accurately, allowing us to explore the cosmos faster and more deeply than ever before. This past decade, SETI scientists have examined some 1,000 star systems. In the next 10 years, at least 1,000 times as many may be scanned. There are a lot of computers, there are a lot of digital electronics over there. The idea is to narrow the focus of these things, so we're looking at really only one spot on the sky where there might be a star with planets, and then to look over millions of different frequencies, different spots on the radio dial looking for that signal that would tell you, hey, there's somebody up there. About six hours travel south of the Bernie installation, through the sun, pine forests, and great mountain regions of the American West, lies the San Francisco Bay Area with its nine million inhabitants. It's the birthplace of the personal computer. And it's now home to one of the most innovative regions on Earth. After 800 meters, take the exit right, then turn left. Silicon Valley, in the Southern Bay Area, is the base for the world's most well-known computer companies. In the heart of the valley, you'll find Mountain View, where SETI has its headquarters. The radio telescopes in Hat Creek, some 500 kilometers to the north, can be operated from here via the internet. The data it collects is also analyzed here. Do you think there is some extraterrestrial society or, well, or, or I intelligence? Don't, well, I don't think they're gonna be like us, uh, but I think that uh, from my studies, nothing here is, is a showstopper, in other words, Nothing has occurred here on Earth that couldn't occur somewhere else. Whether you look at the environment, you look at the development of technology, of intelligent species, of a star that shines very steady. You look at all the factors that go into why we're here, and it could happen just about anywhere else in the galaxy. Astrophysicist Dr. Lawrence Doyle heads a 49-strong team of NASA scientists who recently made world news. Using the Kepler Space Telescope, they became the first team to discover planets orbiting around a binary star system. Planets with two suns. Kepler was specifically launched to search for Earth-like planets that may be habitable. By the time we found them, they will probably have found us. Because like if the average sun, if the average star is older than the sun by 10 million years, and everything that happened here happened there, they may not be interested in us uh, because they're that much smarter. I think that they could um, study us from a distance where we would never know we were being studied. Uh, people that said they were picked up by spaceships and things like that, they don't need to do that. The nearest star, if you look at, if this was the Earth and this is the Moon, on that scale, the nearest star is from here in San Francisco to London. So an extraterrestrial has an enormous way to come to actually get here. The SETI Institute has also set up a collaborative web project, Earth Speaks. People across the world can suggest what humanity should communicate if an intelligent extraterrestrial signal is discovered. Here's an example. Dear fellow universe inhabitants, assuming you are more intelligent, my advice would be stay away for now and wait for us to reach the same phase as you. Right now, however, we're too occupied with trying hard to destroy the planet and each other, believing in hundreds of gods that are incompatible and focusing mainly on individual wealth. Let us try and fix this mess ourselves, that way it will stick. Until then, enjoy the show. 
I'm Dr. Douglas Vakoch, Director of Interstellar Message Composition at the SETI Institute, and I think about how we would make messages that would be understandable by civilizations around other stars. We know the building blocks of life are strewn about the galaxy, but aliens will not speak English. It, you know, if we make contact with another civilization, they're not going to speak English or Dutch or Swahili. So what then? Um, I think the best starting place is mathematics and science. Um, and why, why math? Because if we get a message, we know that they have the technology to send us that message. And it's hard to imagine how you can be a good uh, engineer on another world if you don't at least know that two plus two equals four. So we could try to communicate using the language of mathematics. But before that, we would need to be able to recognize an intelligent signal when it's arrived. How can we distinguish these sounds from the background noise of the cosmos? Whoa. <laughs> so this is a pulsar. This comes, this is noise coming out of space. Yes. This is actually a, uh, an exploded star that is emitting pulses and what we can do... But you can receive the signal yes. with the radio telescopes. Yeah, exactly. And it's from in here. This is the result of its explosion. Uh, is this an intelligent signal? Sounds like just bubbles, but it turns out it's a communication from a humpback whale. Humpback whales probably have the most complex communication system on Earth, okay. as far as we know. Okay. All right. So Can let's listen it? to some humpback, humpback sounds. Lawrence Doyle has studied the communication systems of intelligence and social animals, yep. such as humpback whales and dolphins. They automatically transfer information faster and more efficiently than humans. Doyle wanted to find out how to distinguish intelligent signals even incomprehensible signals from non-intelligent signals. By using complex information theories to interpret these sounds, he has designed a filter to make this possible. We now have a kind of an intelligence filter. So intelligent communication is something that doesn't necessarily have meaning for you, but has a degree of complexity nested in it. And that's what we can measure. The speed of our search is increasing with time, and that's because of technology. So if this experiment is going to succeed at all, if we're ever going to pick up a signal coming from another society, I think it's going to happen before the mid part of this century. If it doesn't happen by then, then I think there's something wrong with what we're doing. But if a signal is actually received from extraterrestrial intelligence, would it be wise to send a message back? Stephen Hawking, the British physicist and cosmologist, regarded by many as the present-day Einstein, thinks it could be dangerous. Stephen Hawking said that they could be very big, very bad, and very busy. Stephen Hawking is, is already too late, right? Because we've, over the past 70 years or so, we've been transmitting signals, not intentionally, but our television signals, such as yours, and, tele and broadcast radio. They leak off the planet, so that horse is already out of the barn. If they're really dangerous and they can travel between the stars, what are we going to do anyway? You'd have to turn off all the lights in New York City, because those could be detected with a big enough telescope. And the aliens, any aliens that can come from one star to the next, they could pick up that light. So what are you going to do? Turn off all the lights? Is that what you want to do? Do you want to condemn humanity to living under a rock forever? Let's presume there is a civilization out there that's much more advanced than we are. These people are much smarter than we are. What do you think that they will think about us? Well, I think you can't get smart and old until you've been foolish and young. I think that's the way evolution works. They probably had a technological um, adolescence in their past, 
So I think any old civilization has a younger past that they can look back at and probably understand that we're an emerging technology. We're the young guys. We haven't yet really figured out how to get along with one another. What, what do you think about species that existed on Earth 10 million years ago? Kind of interesting, not a great concern to you. So I'm not sure that we're really going to be all that interesting to them. So they may be at levels that are so far beyond us that their intelligence is to ours as ours is to the ants. If aliens are looking at Earth, uh, they notice that we have weapons in orbit around the planet and they think, well, these, this species is pretty paranoid. But if they look closer, they'd see the weapons were pointed at ourselves. And that's nuts. <laughs> Maybe it, it happens that you don't find a signal at all. Maybe there, there's nothing out there. Wouldn't that be then a waste of time? I wouldn't spend my life working on something that I didn't think had a chance of succeeding but I don't know what the odds are. As a scientist, I have to admit, the answer might be that we are alone. We're actually trying to find the answer. And if somebody tells you what you should believe, it's not science, that's religion, and but, that's but, not but, what we're about. But would be an awful waste of space if we're all there is, yes. Whatever the answer to these questions, if extraterrestrial civilizations do exist, Scientists say they are extremely far away, at least four light years. Using current technology, it would take at least 100,000 years for us to travel this distance. So there's no need to run to the hills quite yet. 